So let's go ahead and draw um, the first name, and we will begin the men's preaching night. All right. The first name is Brother Benjamin. Pastor for this opportunity to preach. I always appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to keep this very sh simple, very short. Um, there's only a few points here, but the title of the sermon is How to Listen to Preaching, right? So what are we to do with all this preaching that we hear week in, week out? Um, does it just go through one ear and out the other? It would seem so sometimes, right? But we're actually supposed to do something with those words and not just come here. This isn't a social club, right? We're here to grow, but we're here to grow for the right reasons. I'll get into that in a second. Point number one, 1 Corinthians 11.31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So that's the verse. The point here is doing a self-assessment scan. So you should be filtering every single word from the preacher against the Bible, right? Does it match? Does it not match? Um, some of you guys who work in produce and stuff, You've seen those machines, the laser, it shoots air if the, one of those pieces of fruit or whatever is no good, shoots air. You should be doing that with the preaching as well. Um, compare it to the Bible, and, com and then finally, compare it against yourself, right? So where are you lacking? Where do you need to improve? Where are some areas that you, under you know that you have difficulties with? You need to apply that preaching to that area of your life. And you should be doing this second after second after second after second after second. You should be hanging on every single word from the, word, from the mouth of the preacher, right? Compare it to the Bible, and then compare it against yourself. Um, so, yeah, just doing basic self-assessments, right? So that's point number one. Point number two, I'll read from um, James 1, through 24, says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So point number two is never be satisfied with who you are at this moment in your life. Never, ever be satisfied with who you are right now, right? Because there's people in our lives in church or out of church, they've just plateaued, right? We get it. We see this all the time in our own families, whatever. But there's people that think, well, I'm the best version of myself right now, and I'll be the best version of myself for the rest of my life. That's not what the Bible tells us to do, though, right? So we're supposed to con continually improve on who we are as Christians, who we are um, in church especially, right? Because this isn't just a, a social clubhouse. We're supposed to be improving ourselves, and I'll get into the third point in a second, but improving ourselves, um, not just for ourselves, but for other reasons. So you should always be trying to improve yourself um, after learning, uh, listening to a sermon, right? So you just heard an hour-long sermon, and hopefully it didn't just go in one ear and out the other. Now you're in the car thinking about what you need to apply. Now you're fellowshipping. Things get brought up in sermon uh, and fellowship, things that you need to apply. It's always easy. It's always extremely easy to point out issues with other people, but why don't you, you know, have a look at yourself first and foremost before you start judging other people. Um, and so uh, to give a good uh, analogy, looking, you know, at the Word of God as like a mirror, right? And if you had, if you look, you know, go into the bathroom or something, and you have a piece of food in your teeth or whatever, are you just going to, um, you know, continue with their day, or are you going to do something about it, right? Some people just decide to continue with their day, but hey, everyone else can see that food. Everyone else can see that issue that you're messed up on, right? So you got to be, learn to be ob objective as well. So part of that point is learning to think objectively, right? Put yourself in other people's shoes and take a long, a good, long, uncomfortable look at yourself, right? Because I guarantee you there's people that will notice things, you, maybe you're not aware of it, right? Maybe you're not aware, but um, that's why you're here to reflect on those the things that are being uh, preached on the, at the pulpit, and then you know doing self-assessments so you can actually see where you're uh, where you're lacking, right? And so just always be able to 
objectively look at yourself, try to put yourself in other people's shoes and look at yourself and you know, look at yourself from a, a third person perspective. Because I guarantee you, looking at yourself from a different perspective is gonna change everything for how you act, with the things you say, and how you behave, especially in church. All right, don't miss that, especially in church, because we're here to be an example for other people, whether we, whether we know it or not, there's other people looking up to us, children, other, other brothers and sisters in Christ, right? So if you're letting things go, continue, and you know where you're messed up on, then you get, all you're going to do is just cause, uh, cause issues for other people, right? So be very self-aware and, uh, you know, just, it's one thing to, I guess, um, have some negative qualities that you're working on, but it's another thing to not even be aware of those negative qualities. That is even worse because everyone else can see that. Guarantee you, especially in a church like this, guarantee you. Point number three, and point number three, if you're not listening to anything else from the sermon, listen to point number three, okay? Point number three is how can the preaching apply to ourselves benefit others? This is the most important point. If you're here just to improve your character, your, your own character, and to improve the quality of your life or to be a better person or whatever the case is, that is that's not as important as the, the ultimate goal of applying preaching to yourself. You apply it to yourself so that you can actually improve the lives of others, putting others before yourself. So I'll just read off a few verses here. Romans 15, 1 through 2 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to, not to please ourselves. Not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Romans 14, 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. What does that take? That takes some objectivity and an understanding that all these people sitting next to you are more important than yourself, right? Put everyone else in front of you and stop being selfish. We all, we get it. We all have selfish tendencies. You know, it is what it is. But the point is, is to be aware of those selfish tendencies, right? You can't fix something that you're not aware of. Uh, Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. So we should be here doing what? Preferring each other over ourselves. And I, I guarantee you this right now. If all you're here for is to improve yourself, improve your own character, you're going to become extremely unbalanced. And people are going to see that by the things you say and by the things you do. You'll be very unbalanced. People are going to start seeing that. Well, you're only focusing on yourself. You're only you know, trying to improve your own character. Um, that's not the, sorry, that thing <laughs> messed me up. Um, the ultimate, uh, I guess the ultimate point here to focus on is that we're here for other people's benefits, not just for ourselves. Yeah, it's great to, you know, improve our lives and all that stuff, but why are we improving our lives? What's, you know, what's the goal, right? It doesn't help if we just improve our lives and then everyone else around us suffers, right? So we should be putting everyone else's needs over ours, and that's the whole reason why we're here listening to preaching and how to listen to preaching. So scan things that you hear from the preacher, compare it against the Bible and against yourself. Never be satisfied with who you are, never. Always be trying to improve yourself and do it for the benefit of others, um, not just your own. So uh, let's remember why we're here. So that's my sermon. So we'll just close out in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for um, this opportunity to preach. I thank you for the Bible, Father, for the only true foundation we have in this whole world, Father. And I pray that um, uh, we would listen to the preaching and that it would, uh, we can apply it to ourselves ultimately to uh, help everyone else grow around us and not to lay stumbling blocks before them. And I just pray that you would bless the next preacher and uh, the rest of the preaching to come, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Brother Max. Turn to Joshua 4.
14, please. Joshua 14 in your Bible. Joshua chapter 14. The title of my sermon this evening is Old Age Isn't the End. Old Age Isn't the End. So I want to give give everyone some encouragement that even when you get older, maybe you are you know, older, we're all getting older every day, God still has plans for you. God still has work that he wants you to do in your life. Um, and I want to give you some encouragement this evening. So look down at Joshua 14 in verse number 5. Let's start reading in Joshua 14, 5 says, As the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenazite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me in thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. As he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. As yet I am as strong, verse 11, this day, as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war both to go out and to come in. So what I want to talk about and use this passage of Caleb talking to Joshua here as an example um, of, of God's plan for you in your old age and things you can enjoy uh, when you get older. And the first point is that you can be buff or you can be strong in your old age. And Caleb said in verse um, 11, he says, as yet... I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. If you remember, if you noticed in verse 10, he said, Lo, I'm this day four score and five years old. So Caleb saying he was as strong at 85 as he was at 40. So those 45, those 40 years in the wilderness, those five years on the other side of Jordan with Joshua, um, he says he's still as strong. He says age, age didn't stop him. Age wasn't hindering him in this regard. Um, and this wasn't preventing him from still being at the forefront of the leadership of the children of Israel and of conquering the promised land. Um, and I'm going to read you Deuteronomy 24-7. says, And Moses, it was the same thing with Moses, was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. So it's saying Moses, Moses was 80 when God spoke to him in the burning bush. And then he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And then he was 40 years in the wilderness. And it says, when he died, his natural force had not abated. Like, he was still as strong, he was still as driven and as focused, and his vision was still as clear, uh, you know, whether it's f talking physically there or metaphorically, he was still as sharp as he was um, through his whole life. So you can have this as well. God can help you be firing on cylinders when you're, when you're really old. My great-grandmother, who I met, um, had the pleasure of meeting, she died when she was 103, and she was sharp all the way to the end. And God can help you, you know, even in your old age, um, be strong physically and be strong mentally and have all of this so that you can help fight God's battles as well. Let's look at uh, down in verse 11. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 11, As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, for my strength was then, even so is my strength now. Notice, for war, both to go out and to come in. Verse 12, Now therefore give me this mountain. Whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. So point number two is not only can you be strong in your old age, but you can fight and win battles in your old age. And you notice how Caleb at the end of verse 11, he says for war. So his strength is for war. He's still in the fight. He's still at the front of this battle. And then he says, um, therefore give me this mountain, but the Anakims are there. The Anakims were the giants. And it says the cities were great and fenced. So he knows this is a challenge. He knows this is going to be a difficult, difficult battle. But he says, I want that. I want to fight that battle. Even though it's going to be difficult, he doesn't say, hey, give it to the younger guys. I'll just re retire on the other side of Jordan. No, he's like, I want that mountain. And that's where we get the name of that, that awesome song. But notice it says in verse 12, in the middle there, it says, if so be that the Lord will be with me. So ultimately, God is the one helping him in all of this. It's not his physical strength. It's God helping him. And this is the real takeaway of the sermon. If you notice back in verse, uh, at the end of verse 8, at the end of verse 9, 
And in verse 14, it says, Thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God, but I followed the Lord my God, wholly following the Lord his God. It says it three times. That's really the key to all of this, is wholly following the Lord. That's how he'll give you the strength. That's how he'll help you. God will help you to fight and win these battles uh, in your old age. And conversely, don't let being young stop you from serving God. Don't let that stop you from fighting the battles. If you're, you know, a child or a teenager or some, you know, you can, you can fight battles and, and have victory in your life too. You don't have to wait till you're an adult. Start fighting those battles and standing up for the things of God when you're young. And our battle, obviously Caleb in this story, the physical, his physical battle was for the promised land, was for this mountain. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, 12 says, right? Our battle is, is spiritual warfare. And how do we fight that? We go soul winning. And so God can help you even when you're, when you're older, he can help you go soul winning. And that is the greatest contribution to the spiritual battle and the spiritual warfare that's going on in this world is going soul winning and rescuing those lost souls and bringing them to our side. Amen, right? So let's keep reading in verse 13. It says, and Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, unto this day. Notice, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. There it is again. That's the third, third reference to it right there. So my third point is not only well, can God give you strength, not only can he help you fight and, and win battles in your, life's, uh, in your life, but you can enjoy blessings in your old age. And that's, that's one of the greatest things probably about getting old, um, but there's so many blessings. And notice it says uh, Joshua blessed him and gave him this uh, land as an inheritance. So Caleb wanted that. He wanted the fight, and God gave him the strength because he had wholly followed the Lord. God gave him the strength to take this mountain, to take it. That must feel really good, right? Better than saying, I'll just retire on the other side of Jordan, and I'll have my little spot, right? He took that mountain, and that's where that was his inheritance. So God has blessings, many blessings for us when we get older. He's got, you know, the blessings of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, uh, the blessings of you know, having more time if you're retired and maybe you're not working a full-time job, you can focus on making an impact in different areas at church. Um, and then wisdom, right? When you get older and you can be a you know, mentor to, to other younger people in church or in your family, that's a great blessing. Somebody that comes to mind to me is Job. I'm going to read you Job 42, 12, and 13 says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job, right? Remember, Job lost everything. But says, the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. So Job had all the possessions. God gave him all of it back. He had the 401k. He had the Corvette or whatever other quintessential retirement things there are. But he had his seven sons and his three daughters too. And that's probably the, the, one of the greatest blessings. Um, and if you don't have physical children, find someone in the church, find Find someone who you can mentor and you can teach and you can impart your wisdom to. Um, and to kind of wrap things up tonight, the real takeaway is you don't get any of this. You don't get the strength. God won't give you the strength. He won't give you the blessings. He won't give you the victory in these battles if you're not wholly following him. That's the real takeaway is where it says, Caleb wholly followed the Lord his God. That's the real takeaway. And the hoary head, Proverbs 16.31 says, the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. So pursue righteousness, wholly follow the Lord, and he'll give you these blessings in your old age, just as Caleb. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to preach. I pray that um, you'd help us all to, to remember your word. Please bless the next preacher this evening and, and the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Luke. All right, everybody. So, um... Brother Garrett could probably attest to this, but, you know, in construction, you meet some guys with some wacky beliefs, and uh, they're pretty, uh, you know, uh, loud about it at times. But um, recently at work, um, if you ever met, like, older Christian people, um, sometimes they have, like, these Christian-esque jokes or these sayings that they say, um, and they're not always biblically accurate, and you're just kind of like, mm, like, I don't really want to, like, laugh at that. That's kind of dumb. They're, you know, it could lead you down the wrong way. Like, I've heard somebody say, uh, Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm a pan-millennialist, uh, so one way or the other, it'll pan out. It doesn't matter if pre-trib or post-trib, and it's like, well, I mean, first off, the millennial thing and the tribulation thing, those are like two different things, so you don't even know what you're talking about, first off. And then uh, 
the Bible says that you're going to be offended if you don't know, if you don't watch and stuff like that. So, I mean, you're kind of going against what the Bible says just right off the bat right there. But uh, aside from that, I've heard somebody, uh, they said a joke, I guess you can call it that, and they said, um, they said, uh, or a riddle, rather. It was a riddle. And they said, um, what is the one man-made thing in heaven? And I was, I mean, immediately I'm like, nothing. Like, you know, like, what are you talking about? And then he's like, the wounds on Jesus' hands and feet. And then I was just kind of like, okay, like, you know, but uh, it got me thinking, and it's, uh, you know, that's actually not true. So, I mean, uh, if you see uh, John chapter 10, in John chapter 10, starting at verse 10, it says, uh, The thief cometh not, cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. There you go, giveth his life, right? But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The, hiring, the hireling fleeth because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. Again, I lay down my life. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So, I mean, right there, it just kind of destroys that. He laid his life down. Man didn't take that from him. Jesus laid that down, right? And it says, uh, you know, uh, he commendeth his love toward us and while, in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? But even uh, before that, I mean, if you go to Isaiah 53... Isaiah 53, 9 through 11. So Isaiah 53, 9 through 11, it says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And then it goes on, uh, he shall see the travail of his, of, of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So, Jesus laid that life down, he laid his life down, but it was also the Father's will that he do that. It, was, it pleased the Father to, bru to, to bruise Jesus Christ. That was that was the wrath that was abiding on you, I, every unbeliever, and Christ took that upon himself. He laid it down, and the Father dished it. Man, that's, that has nothing to do with man. That's Jesus Christ and the Father, right? So, again, you know, uh, Jesus laid that down, and that's very important to understand because, I mean, if you start thinking that man took that from him and stuff like that, you're starting to lose track of, you know, the whole, the whole sacrifice, you know, the whole reason that Christ laid, gave his life, Right? So, no man took that from Jesus Christ. But I started thinking about that a little bit more. And, you know, you get the earliest prophecy uh, of Jesus Christ, I think, mentioned in the Bible. That's Genesis 3.15, right? The, the seed of the woman whose he will bruise the head of the serpent, right? So, all the way back there, you're being told that Jesus is going to do this, right? But then if you think about uh, John chapter 1, go over to John chapter 1, I mean, if you want to follow along. But in John chapter 1, Starting at verse 1, as soon as I get there, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in, in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So, I mean, Jesus Christ is, is the medium to which the, the, the Godhead created all things man included, right? So Jesus Christ created everything. He was, he, he's, he's how everything came to be. He's the word of God, right? God spoke everything into existence, let there be light, you know, all that. So Jesus Christ, uh, a third of the Godhead, along with the Father and the Holy Ghost, right? They created man. 
But not only did they create man, you know, they didn't just create it willy-nilly. I mean, God is, uh, he's all-knowing. He had to have known that I'm going to create man and they're going to rebel against me. They're going to turn, they're going to turn their backs on me. They're, they're going to, they're not going to uh, trust me. They're going to trust in themselves. They're going to do all these wicked things. Yet he did it anyway. You know what I mean? And not only did he do it anyway, but he's like, well, I'm going to create them. They're going to rebel against me. I, I see that coming, but I'm going to make a way to where they can get right with me. Even though, even though they're going to just turn their back on me. You know what I'm saying? And that really, uh, I mean, I started off just kind of thinking, you know, oh, that's, a, that's an important thing to remember is that, you know, Jesus laid it down. You kind of need to know that it's integral to the gospel. But then also start, it started getting me thinking about God's love and how he created us knowing that. He knew, you know what I mean? Uh, it says that uh, Jesus Christ is the lamb, you know, slain from the foundation of the world. That's First uh, Peter, right? So you go over there, First Peter chapter 1. As soon as I get there, huh? First Peter chapter one, and that'd be starting at eighteen. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as, a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. So again, that's foreordained before the foundation. So, I mean, while God was thinking up what he was going to do, he knew what was going to happen, and he knew that a third of himself would have to suffer for us so that we can be right with him. I mean, think about that. I mean, um, how often do we do something good for somebody knowing that they're never going to be able to pay it back? How often do we do something for somebody knowing that they're probably going to spit on it, treat it terribly, turn their back on us, and not, not value what we've given them? Um, it's a reminder of uh, how we should be long-suffering, just as God is long-suffering, just as he cared for us, just as uh, he did these things for us. But I, uh, I just would like you guys to remember that. And one more thing, last, uh, last verse, uh, I like this one a lot. It's Isaiah 49. And Isaiah 49, 13 through 16. As soon as I get there. Isaiah 49, sing, O heaven, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for God hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, but will I not forget thee? Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. So, I mean, just remember that... Uh, Man may forget the good things that you do. You may forget the things that people have done for you, but you should never forget what God has done for you because he's graven you upon the palms of his hands even before you're even being formed in your mother's womb. It's just something to remember. All right, that's, the, that's my sermon. Uh, Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for all the people here. I pray that you will be with the next uh, preacher and be with the, the fellowship and the food to come. And in Christ Jesus, my name we pray. Amen. Brother George. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Um, I really like this verse. Think about it a lot. Uh, but just before that, in Mark chapter 5, we got... Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, and he just, uh, he just cast out uh, the legion out of the man, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the leaders of the Pharisees, I think his name was Justice, he, he, uh, he went to Jesus because his daughter was, was sick, and, and Jesus healed her, <clears throat> and 
you know, he's, he's walking through multitudes and people are, are hanging on him and, and he's healing them. And, uh, and there's a parallel passage in Matthew 13 of, of, of Mark 6 where Jesus is doing this uh, awesome sermon where he's uh, preaching in parables, you know, sermon of the sower. And um, he, he's, doing, he's doing all these things you know, and proving that he's God, right? And then here comes uh, Mark chapter 6, and it says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the syn synagogue. And, hearing, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man all these things? Hath, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even much, such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Hoseas, and of Judah, and Simon? And are not his sisters with us? And don't miss this. And they were offended at him. So, so we, here we have God. He's, he, everybody knows about him already, right? Because the man that was healed uh, from the from the legion, right? He he went and told everybody. He it says that uh, he published, you know, all the things that Jesus had done for him, right? And um, so, being in a church like this, you know, we're gonna we're gonna learn uh, we're gonna learn a lot of things from the Bible, and people they're gonna be astonished, and people are gonna get offended for for. Uh, or the things that we believe in this in this in this church going to a church like this so <clears throat> all that's introduction and I want to apply this to um, homeschooling your kids so um, this church teaches that we should homeschool our kids and so why should we homeschool our kids well and uh, my first point is uh, so that way we, we can teach them to fear the Lord Amen. so in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 it says, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, so um, the beginning of knowledge. So these kids in, the, in this church, you know, they'll, they'll be getting saved at five, five years old, you know. You know, I didn't get saved until I was 30 years old. So, you know, that, there, you know I didn't have the fear of the Lord, you know what I mean? So my beginning of knowledge was at 30 years old. Right? These kids are getting saved at five years old. That's their, that's their beginning of knowledge. Right? In, uh, <clears throat> on, in Proverbs uh, chapter 9, verse 10, the Bible says, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So, so these kids are, are fearing the Lord. They're, they're getting saved young. Uh, they're, they're, they have the beginning of wisdom. And, and knowledge, right? And, and they're, getting, they're gaining understanding, okay? So um, <clears throat> let's go, you know, you know there was a, a sermon that Pastor did where it, it was about uh, abiding in the vine. This is abiding in the vine right here, you know? You know, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding uh, of the Bible. And so let, let's, uh, if you want, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> chapter 6. Verse 1, the Bible says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land where, whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God keep, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy, thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. <clears throat> Skip down to verse uh, 5. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt, walk <clears throat> and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and while, when thou raisest up. So the Bible here, you know, is teaching that we should be uh, 
teaching them to fear the Lord, right? Beginning of knowledge and wisdom, when? All the time. You know, so sending your kids off to uh, public school, you know, they're gonna, be, they're gonna be gone all day at public school. You know, you're not gonna have time to, to teach them to fear the Lord. You know, most of these kids in public school, they're not even saved. They don't even know about Jesus. You know, when we go, when we go, preaching, uh, when we go preaching the gospel to, to, to people, you know, we, sometimes, you know, we, we might see little kids and we might, you know, the ladies will talk to them usually and, and they haven't even heard of Jesus. You know, they don't fear the Lord. They're not saved, you know, and, and it says here that you should do it when thou risest up and when thou walkest by the way, when thou lies down, when thou raises up all the time, you know. So so people will say, <clears throat> you know, is this not is this not George, you know? You know, is this not George? Where where hath he all this wisdom? You know what I mean? In in, in Mark chapter six, it's like they'll be astonished that you 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 uh, homeschool your kids, and they'll be offended too. They'll be offended at it. <clears throat> so you say, you know, they'll say so. You're gonna really teach your kid to to fear the Lord, to feel to fear Jesus. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're gonna teach our kids to do that because this isn't this isn't long-haired hippie, you know, dress wearing Jesus Baptist Church. You know what I mean? This is this is uh, Jesus with a vesture dripping blood. Baptist Church. You know, a two-edged sword will come out of his mouth. Baptist Church, right? This is, uh, you know, this, this is um, where Jesus uh, tells people that are trusting in their works, you know, depart from me, I never knew you, ye workers of iniquity. That's the real Jesus, right? So that's my first point. Why you should homeschool kids, fear of the Lord, right? My second point is, why should we homeschool the kids? Uh, kids is uh, correction, child rearing, spanking. You know, <clears throat> when you send them off to public school, they're gonna they're gonna meet all these kids that are unsaved and you know being brought up in the world. And <clears throat> you're not gonna you're not gonna catch them when they're doing something wrong out there. You know, they're not gonna have any correction, right? So. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter th uh, 13, verse 24, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasten him be times. You know, how are you going to be able to chasten your kids be times if, if your kids are always gone at public school, you know, getting confused, you know, being taught that, that you can be a girl a boy could be a girl, or a, or a girl could be a boy. You know, that's wicked as hell. You know, the Bible says that uh, Jesus said in the Bible, he said that if, if, any, if any one of you would offend a little child, it'd be better that you were cast into the ocean with a weight wrapped around your neck, you know? So people that are sending their kids to public school, Jesus says that, you know, your kids are going to be offended in public school. And Jesus said it'd be better if you were just thrown in the ocean. Okay? Because those kids aren't going to uh, be chastened. And those kids aren't going to learn to fear the Lord. They're not going to get saved over there. Right? And Jesus loves the kids. In Proverbs chapter 23, the Bible says in verse 12, Apply thine heart into instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child. Uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, uh, thank you for this church. Thank you for um, the doctrine of, of homeschooling in the Bible. And uh, I just thank you for uh, your word. And uh, uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, homeschooling and for, you know, especially for uh, giving me a wife that would actually uh, homeschool our kids. And uh, I can't thank you enough. And uh, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Brother Trevor.
right, well, good evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to preach. Always enjoy these men's preaching nights. Um, tonight we want to talk about um, trials or troubles that we'll have in the Christian life and how we can maybe mitigate some of them. We can't mitigate all of them, but we can maybe mitigate some of them. Um, there's a lot of troubles and trials that we can have in the Christian life. Some of those are from God and some of those are from the devil himself. Um, when we talk about trials and troubles that we might have uh, in this Christian life that come from God, these would be things like trials that God puts us through. Job was brought up earlier this evening. Uh, that was the, I mean, none of us are going to have anything comparable in our lives that happened most likely as what happened with Job. But that's a great example of a trial, some, a trial that God is putting him through to test his faith, test his strength as a Christian. Another one is tribulation. Uh, John 16 says, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This persecution or this tribulation is the world on us, for us following what the Bible says, right? There's nothing really we can do about it. We're going to follow the Bible, what it says, no matter what. And whatever the world says, they're going to say, right? We, don't, we, can't, we can't have any control over those. Um, we do need to take note that, you know, in 2024 America, it's pretty light affliction, right? We get upset if somebody says something or we get offended. Um, you know, at least they're not cutting people's heads off. At least they're not burning people alive for, for being Christians. Pastor had a book up here, The Martyr's Mirror. You know, it's this thick. It probably weighs 25 pounds of, of the accounts from the time of Christ all the way to the 17th century of, of Christians that were martyred. And, and really, in America today, it's, it's very light affliction. But the tribulation, we know it's coming. You know, the, the Matthew 24, Mark 13, and, and the Daniel 70th week sermon series, we know that that's coming, but those aren't things that we can necessarily have control over, right? That's the world and what the world does to us. Uh, other troubles or trials that we can have in this Christian life that we do have control over that come from God would be purging. Uh, this was brought up uh, in the John 15 sermon with the, the abiding in the vine. It says in John 15, it says, In every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So this is God pruning us, pruning things out of our lives as we get saved, as we get in church, as we start growing in this Christian life. Maybe we start soul winning, we get a few salvations, and he says, hey, you know what, they're going to be a much more effective Christian and soul winner if they're not listening to worldly music, if they're not involved in alcohol, if they're not involved with these, these certain friends that are weighing them down. These are the purging things that God will do in our life uh, that can seem as trials. Um, one way we can help to mitigate this is by just embracing it, ripping the Band-Aid off, right? If you're sitting in church like Brother Ben was talking about and you hear something and you can apply it to your life, instead of burring up against it and creating this idol of I'm not letting this thing go, you know, that can be, that can be something that will prolong that agony of that purging, right, of that pruning that needs to take place. Uh, the last one that can come from God is this chastisement. Uh, Hebrews 10 talks about uh, you know, if, if we are children of God, there will be chastisement, you know. Uh, Hebrews 10.30 uh, says, uh, For we knoweth him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So trials and troubles that we have in our Christian life, those are ones that would come from God. But we also have to understand that some of the, as a, as a soul winner, especially in a soul winning church like this, that's being effective and and, and winning people for the Lord in the community, there's a target on your back from the devil, right? 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Ephesians 6, 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the devil has, his main goal is obviously to send as many people to hell as possible. He cannot take away our salvation, but he knows he can make us unfruitful. He knows we can make us backslidden. and he can get us out of church. He can cause us to do different things. So the title of the sermon tonight is A Stick to Beat You With. And the point I want to make is let's not give God or the devil a stick to beat us with, right? Don't give God a stick to beat you with. When we talk about the purging, the things that, uh, you know, you come across preaching, you read in your Bible, and it's like, oh, I need to get this out of my life. I need to clean up this. I need to be in church more. I need to whatever those things are. Uh, as we're growing, right? We get saved, we're babes in Christ, we don't know that much, we're not in the right place when we start, so we need to continue to grow. The worst thing we can do is, like I said earlier, make idols out of those things, and I'm not letting this go. I'm gonna, you know, it's like the, it's like the one-year-old with the dirty diaper. It's warm and it's mine, and it's, you know, it's like everybody can smell it. It stinks. Uh, Exodus 32 and verse 20, this is uh, the golden calf, and it says, and he took the calf which they had made, 
and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. Any idol that we set up, whether it be a certain standard or a certain sin in our life or a certain, even it could be, uh, idols could be good things too, right? It could be blessings that God gives us. It could, we could put our spouse in the place of God. We could put our children in the place of God in our life, and that becomes an idol. And God, the way he handles idols in our life, he stamps it to powder and makes us drink it, right? Don't put idols in front of God. When the, when the purging is happening, rip the Band-Aid off. Move forward as fast as you can. Uh, the chastisement, the, the stuff coming from God, don't give God a stick to beat you with. This is a pretty blatant one. You know, we know uh, sins, especially in a church like this, we're reading our Bibles, and we know sins that we ought not be committing and things that we own, all of us only struggle with, right? Uh, don't, don't give God a stick to beat you with in the, in the form of chastisement. We ought to fear, fear for our life for the chastisement of God. If you think of, you know, the Bible talks about the spiritual warfare, right? If you think of it as a soccer team, it's kind of a silly analogy, but if you got, you know, the, the coach of the team that is on the Christian side and you have the coach of the team that's for the devil side, if, you know, there's a Christian guy that's playing, but he's just sitting there picking his nose and he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, there's going to be chastisement for that guy. But woe to the guy that actually goes and trips up the other guys that are actually trying to fight the battle. And we've seen that in the Christian life. Sometimes Christians will, you know, for whatever reason, they're starting to attack a soul-winning church. They're starting to attack people that are actually trying to do things, trying to clean up their lives, trying to, you know, whether it's intentional or they're being blinded, I don't know. But, um, you know, God has killed people in the past for not, for, not, for disobeying him in the Old Testament, right? Uzzah and Onan and multiple others, to name a few. So, you know, if it's a soccer team, uh, you're not going to be in the game very long if you're scoring for the other team, right? So make sure we're not, uh, we'll make sure we're aware of the chastisement of the Lord. But what about Satan? Uh, Satan is also one that, that we can make sure that we're not giving him a stick to beat us with, too. Uh, turn to Daniel chapter number 6. Daniel chapter number 6. Daniel was very good at this. I think Daniel, especially in the position he was in, uh, being taken into the captivity, and then that kingdom being overthrown, uh, he was very aware of his surroundings and aware of, you know, this, this world is not ours, right? We are not here. This is not our home. We're passing through. We're pilgrims in this land. Daniel was very well aware of that. Um, these people, Daniel chapter 6, uh, look down at number 5, verse 5. These people uh, envied Daniel, and they wanted the position he had. They wanted to get him out of where he was, but they didn't have an opportunity to catch him on it. There was no gotchas for Daniel. They said, then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. He wasn't doing anything illegal. He wasn't you know, able to get away with anything. Uh, they weren't able to accuse him of anything that he was doing against the Babylonian or against the Persian Empire. They had to make sure that it was something that he was doing based on what the Bible said that was gonna, they were going to catch him on this, right? Um, a great example of this for the Christian would be the, the Christian tax protester, right? Jesus addressed this issue multiple times, paid the tax. It says in uh, Matthew 17, if you would turn there, Matthew 17, we, we've, there's people, creation uh, evangelists, if you will, that, that have kind of died on this hill, and it's the wrong hill to die on. Right. Jesus addressed the issue directly. And it's essentially a stick that Satan used to beat this person with, or these people that are involved in this kind of stuff. We should make sure that we're living our lives above board in the community that we're in. We happen to be in 2024 America, right? So uh, like it says in Romans chapter 12, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. We should strive to, as much as we can, obviously follow the higher authority, right? The higher power, Romans 13, God is the ultimate authority. And there are certain things in, in, uh, in life that, you know, maybe we don't like or maybe we don't agree with or we don't think is right. And it's maybe not necessarily um, more immoral based on God's law, but yet we should just do it, pay the tax. Matthew 17, 25, he has said yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him saying, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or strangers? Uh, verse 26, Peter saith unto him, of strangers, Jesus saith unto him, then are the children feet free, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. He's not worried about their feelings if they're offended. He's worried about, hey, if we're giving them a softball, you know, there's the old saying, like, the nail that sticks up gets the hammer, right? We don't want to be the one that's like, well, I, you know, I'm free, I'm saved, I don't need to pay taxes. It's a stick that the devil could use to beat us with. If we get thrown in jail, Satan wins. If we're not out here soul winning, oh, Satan wins. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for... Uh, 
this men's preaching night and this opportunity to uh, hear from the men of the church, Lord. Bless the uh, uh, fellowship this evening. Uh, bless everybody here in this church service, Lord, and uh, thank you for uh, an opportunity to be part of a soul-winning church like this. In your name we pray. Amen.